Welcome to the preaching and teaching ministry of Second Baptist Church, where we exist to delight in God, display His grace, and declare His gospel all through Jesus Christ our Lord. We can be reached at www.2bcmtv.org or by calling 618-244-1706. We trust you'll be encouraged and challenged by the message you're about to hear. Well, good morning. If you would please take your Bibles and turn to the book of Hebrews, chapter 6. Our text this morning will be verses 4 through 12, Hebrews chapter 6. In case you're visiting with us, we are uh, making our way through the book of Hebrews. We started it back on Easter Sunday, and we'll finish Lord knows when. I'm not sure, but we're in chapter 6 this morning, and we're looking at verses 4 through 12, Hebrews chapter 6. The title of this morning's message is The Peril of Apostasy and the Assurance of Perseverance. The Peril of Apostasy and the Assurance of Perseverance. Now, that's a mouthful. I I realize that. I recognize that. But that title, I I think, captures two of the major themes that we see not only here in these verses this morning, the text that we're going to look at, but two themes, two of the major themes in the entire book of Hebrews, that if you or I fall away from Christ, if we drift away from him, if we do not hold fast to him, we will not be saved. That's one of the themes that we've seen here in the book of Hebrews. And yet one of the other themes that we have seen in this book is that those who are truly saved, those who are genuinely converted, will not fall away. They cannot fall away. They will persevere in faith to the end. Now, I I recognize that that is what we call a circular argument. A circular argument that those who fall away will not be saved, but those who are saved will never fall away. That's a circular argument, but that does not make it untrue. And the reason I say these are two of the major themes of this book is because if you remember, this entire book, the book of Hebrews, is structured around five warning passages in this book. Let me just refresh your memory where we've been so far. If you'll look back for just a moment in chapter 2 and in verse 1, the author of Hebrews says, chapter 2, verse 1, warning us not to drift away from Christ because if we do, how will we escape the judgment of God? Or chapter 3 in verse 12, if you remember, he says, take care, brothers, Lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. And now we here come to another one in chapter 6. We'll see another one in chapter 10. We'll see another one in chapter 12. Five warnings warning us that if, if we fall away, if we fail to persevere to the end, we cannot and we will not be saved. Now, To say that these five warning passages here have been the cause of much confusion and much controversy and much debate among Christians is quite the understatement. The meaning of these warning passages has been at the center of disagreement among Christians, ranging in a variety of interpretations among scholars, and none of them, none of these five warning passages has created more controversy and received more attention and caused more angst than the one right here before us this morning. Here in chapter 6, dating all the way back to the time of the Reformation, interpreters have been puzzled over this passage because it seems to speak here of a genuine spiritual saving experience that some of our original readers has had 
But then only to be told with the threat of judgment, notice in verse 6, that it is impossible for those who have fallen away to restore them again to repentance. That is a terrifying statement. But even from a pastoral perspective, this passage has troubled many people. It's unsettling, it, it's, it's terrifying to thinking that this could, this could describe me. In fact, I, I've had people come to me and say, I, is this me? To think that they have committed this unpardonable sin and thus are unsavable, irredeemable, raising doubts about their salvation and their assurance, or... The question becomes, how do we reconcile this passage with other New Testament passages that would seem to teach us that God keeps his elect from ever falling away? How, how do we reconcile that with what is said here of the impossibility of being restored again to repentance? So how do we make sense of this? And I, I just want to, from the very outset, allow... The words of the Prince of Preachers, Charles Spurgeon, to set the tone for us this morning from the very beginning. Preaching on this particular te text, in fact, go read his sermon, it's a lot better than this one. But preaching on this text, listen to what he says and how we should approach these verses. Spurgeon writes this. There is scarce a passage of scripture which has not been disputed between the enemies of truth and upholders of it. But this passage, one before us today with one or two others, has been a special subject of attack. This is one of the texts which have been trodden under the feet of controversy, and there are opinions upon it as adverse as the North and South Poles, some asserting that it means one thing and some declaring that it means another. We think that some of them approach somewhat near the truth, but others of them desperately err from the mind of the Spirit. And then listen to what he says here. We come to this passage ourselves with the intention of reading it with the simplicity of a child, and whatever we find therein, to state it. And if it may not seem to agree with something we have hitherto held, we are prepared to cast away every doctrine of our own rather than one passage of Scripture. In other words, whatever problems there are in our understanding and interpretation of this passage, it isn't with God. It isn't with this book. It is with us. And so we need to let this warning this morning have its say. And we need to heed it, and we need to listen carefully. Let's read our text, Hebrews chapter 6. When you find your place there, if you're able, would you please stand out of honor for the reading of God's word? Beginning in verse 4. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. For land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed and its end is to be burned. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness and to have the full assurance of hope until the end so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. May God bless the reading and the preaching of his word, and help us. Amen. You can be seated. I, 
The section of Hebrews that we're in right now, which, as I told you, ranges from chapter 5, verse 11, to the end of chapter 6, in verse 20. This, this entire section here, I told you, is a parenthesis. It, 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 it's a pastoral parenthesis. It's, it's, it's a pause in the author's argument where he has been, if you remember, unpacking and explaining for us the high priestly ministry of Jesus, which if you remember, he began back at the end of chapter 4 there where we saw that Jesus is our great high priest who has passed through the heavens and because he is the God-man, the one mediator, he has made a way for sinners to enter into the presence of God. And that theme will occupy his attention really through chapter 10. So this is really the bulk of the book of Hebrews. And in chapter 5, notice in verse 10, he introduced us to this glorious reality that Jesus is a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek, this shadowy, obscure figure mentioned only a few times in the Old Testament, who Jesus is a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, not after the order or the line of Aaron, which all the other high priests were. No, he's after the order of Melchizedek, which means, according to chapter 5 and verse 6, that Jesus is a priest forever. That his high priestly ministry will have no end. And thus he is superior to all the other high priests under the Old Covenant. And so the author, he wants to explain for them now the meaning of Jesus' Melchizedekian priesthood. That's what he wants to talk about, which he will do so in the entirety of chapter 7. But before he does that, before he can, before he can get there, he first has to deal with a problem. He has to address a problem with these original readers. A problem, if you remember that we said, is really the problem in the book of Hebrews. What's the problem? Well, chapter 5, notice in verse 11, he says about this, about this Melchizedekian priesthood of Christ, we have much to say to you. There's a lot we need to teach you about this. And it is hard to explain. This is hard. Why? Because they're too dumb to get it? Because they don't have enough theological knowledge? No, that's not what he says. Notice verse 11. It's hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. There's the problem. They have become spiritually lazy. They have become spiritually apathetic. They have become spiritually sluggish. Meaning, the author fears they don't have the spiritual appetite for what it is he wants to tell them. The problem isn't an intellectual one with the ears. The problem is a spiritual one with their hearts. They are spiritually immature. They are like spiritual infants who aren't growing. Why? Verse 14, because they aren't putting into practice what they already know. They're hearing it isn't resulting in obedient faith. That's the problem. And so he exhorts them in chapter 6 and verse 1 to go on. Go on to maturity. Go on to being spiritually mature, which brings us now to this third warning passage here that we encounter in Hebrews. And now we see the vitally important connection here between last week's message of being dull of hearing and this week's message of the danger of apostasy and the connection here between them is absolutely critical. Now why? Because it means that spiritual apathy isn't neutral. It isn't neutral. There there is no such thing as a static Christian. You are either a person is falling away or they are going on to spiritual maturity. There's no such thing as a static Christian who isn't growing. 
No, we must move on to spiritual maturity. We must go on to being mature in Christ. And now, here in our passage, the author must explain why we must go on to spiritual maturity. In fact, look there in verse 4 of our text. It begins with a for. It begins with a because. So our passage this morning is a ground for what he just told us last week. The reason we can't remain spiritual infants is because to remain there puts you at risk. It puts you in a dangerous position of falling away into apostasy. This is a wake-up call. Now, apostasy, what, what is that? Well, we've, we've talked about it at length in weeks prior in this series, apostasy. But apostasy, an apostate, simply means this. It means someone who has abandoned the faith. Someone who has walked away from the faith. Someone who has repudiated the gospel. And that's the danger facing these readers. Remember the temptation to turn away from Christ and to go back to Judaism. But undoubtedly, I think probably you've seen this before as well, have you not? Someone, I'm sure you know many people who once professed faith in Christ only later to abandon that confession. They fell in love with the things of the world. They they counted the costs of what it was going to mean to follow Jesus, and they didn't like what that was going to mean, and they turned away. They didn't want to give up sin. They didn't want to give up sexual sin or something like that, and they turned away from the faith. You know, we have a fancy new word for it today. Many call it deconstructing. In reality, the Bible just simply says it's falling away. That's apostasy. It is a a willful renunciation of one's previous allegiance to Jesus. Let me say that again. It is a willful renunciation of one's previous allegiance to Jesus. And it happens all the time. Sometimes after years. Years of confessing Christ, years of sitting under sermons, years of mission trips and ministry and church attendance, years only to walk away. So how are we to make sense of that? Well, the biblical answer is that those who ultimately apostatize were never truly converted to begin with in the first place. They were never truly converted to begin with in the first place. 1 John 2.19, John says, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but it went out that it might become plain that they All are not of us. The proof that they were never truly saved is they didn't continue with us, John says. Even after what seemed to be all the evidence to the contrary, there is actually no real lasting faith. There's no true, genuine, saving faith. And it may have seemed that way for a while, but it wasn't real. And it wasn't lasting. You remember Jesus himself, he illustrates this for us. Remember in the parable of the four soils in Mark chapter 4? Each of the four soils is describing differing responses to God's word. There's that first soil, if you remember the rocky soil, that pictures those who hear the word, but it it has no effect. There, there There is no growth, there is no fruitfulness, there is no response. The second soil, if you remember, receives that word enthusiastically at first and then only then quickly to reject it because of the cost of following Jesus. But then there's that third soil, if you remember, the one that fell among the thorns, the seed that begins to grow and everything looks good. And by all appearances, it seems the plant to be healthy But something else is growing with it. 
It's the thorns, it's the weeds. And it chokes it out, it chokes out the seed. But make no mistake about it, there was a season for a while of apparent health and growth and life, and yet it doesn't last, it doesn't endure, and it withers away and it dies. And it's only that fourth soil, if you remember, the good soil that receives the word and the seed produces and it sprouts and it grows and it's fruitful and it endures. And Jesus' parable is a vivid illustration that the only soil in which there is lasting fruit that endures is of all four soils, the soil where the word of God has truly, genuinely taken root. And so those who commit apostasy, it never took root. It never took root. They they, they were never true converts to begin with. But now, here's, here's the problem, though, when we come to these warning passages in the book of Hebrews, because we, we can believe, church, in the perseverance of the saints. We can believe that those who are truly saved will persevere to the end. And, you know, we can, you know, we can like good Calvinists, we can believe that God will keep his elect to the end, that apostates were never true converts. But then here's what happens. We tend then to read these warnings as if we're reading somebody else's mail. You ever had that happen? Like, you get a letter in the mail and you read it and you're like, what is this? And you say, oh, this is my neighbor's mail. And you're reading somebody else's mail. It's not for you. And it's the same here. The same is true that we think that these warnings aren't for us. Oh, well, this could never happen to me. This isn't for me. This isn't meant for me. I'm a Christian. And yet what I want you to see this morning is that these warnings are for us. They are for Christians. And they are a means of God's grace in your life to keep you from falling away. In fact, that's the structure here. Just notice with me, chapter 6, verses 4 to 8. He's going to give, verses 4 to 8, he's going to give the warning. He's going to warn us of the danger of apostasy. What is the warning here? And who's it addressed to? That's important. But then notice in verses 9 through 12, he's going to turn right around after this warning and he's going to offer them a word of comfort. He's going to offer them a word of encouragement because he believes they will endure. He believes they are truly saved because of what is evident in their lives. And it's a reminder to us that genuine salvation results in visible, lasting fruit. Two headings. Number one, the peril of apostasy, verses four through eight. And I'm just going to warn you this morning. No pun intended. Now, I'm going to warn you this morning that I'm going to spend most of my time, almost all of my time right here. The peril of apostasy, verses 4 through 8. And then secondly, the assurance of perseverance in verses 9 through 12. Hopefully we'll have time to look at that. First, notice the peril of apostasy in verses 4 through 8. Look at verse 4. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit, And have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come, verse 6, and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance. Now, first of all, what you need to know is that historically there have been three major views in how to understand and interpret this warning and really all the warnings in the book of Hebrews. I've mentioned them to you before, but I probably need to briefly do so again. Three ways of understanding this, okay? Let me just give them to you very briefly. Number one, first we'll call it the Arminian view. The Arminian view, which states that these warning passages in Hebrews are directed at true, genuine believers. 
They're directed at real, born-again Christians who it is actually possible for them to lose their salvation, to fall away, to be genuinely saved and fall away from a state of grace. Many of you probably grew up in the Armenian view. Genuine Christians who once possessed saving faith only later to renounce that faith and lose the salvation that they once had. But that should sound absurd to you. That should be really hard to swallow because of the overwhelming litany of scriptures that speak against that view. I mean, I don't even even have time to list all of the scriptures that speak against that view. Scriptures that say things like, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. Philippians chapter 1. Or those whom God justifies, he also glorifies. Romans chapter 8. Or that he gives his sheep, his elect, eternal life, and no one can snatch them out of his hand. John chapter 10. Or Jude 24 and 25. He is able to keep you from stumbling and present you blameless before the presence of his glory. I mean, just scripture after scripture. That's view number one, the Armenian view. Second view. We'll call it the traditional reformed view. The traditional reformed view. This was held, is held by guys like John Grud- or Wayne Grudem, John Calvin, John Owen. Sometimes it's called the mixed view or it's called the tests of genuineness view. The vic- mi- mixed view, the traditional reformed view, meaning that the audience here to whom this author writes is mixed. It's composed of both Christians and we might call them almost Christians in the church. So these warnings in the book of Hebrews then are addressed to the almost Christians, not the genuine. So the warnings are not addressed to genuine believers because genuine believers, this view says, cannot fall away. And so those who apostatize were never really saved in the first place, and thus these warnings aren't for them. They're they're for that second and third soil in Jesus' parable. So their function then is to wake up the unbelievers in the church. The almost Christians among them, they're not for real believers. Now again, there's a lot of merit to that view. Many of you, I think in this room, probably hold that view, and that's okay. And I agree with a lot of that view. I agree that those who fall away were never truly saved. I agree that the elect will always persevere to the end because they're kept by the almighty power of God. Absolutely. I agree with that 100%. But there are, I think, a few glaring problems with that view. First one, which I hope to show you. These warnings are addressed to genuine believers. They're addressed to real Christians. And secondly, the things listed there in our text in verses 4 and 5 describe someone who is genuinely converted. Someone who is a believer. Who has been enlightened. Who has tasted the heavenly gift. Who shares in the Holy Spirit. Things all pertaining to real salvation. Real conversion. I believe. So what view do I take? Let me give you the third. The means of salvation view. The means of salvation view. This view is popularly held by Tom Schreiner and Charles Spurgeon held this view, which states that these are real warnings given to real Christians. Warning about the very real danger of apostasy. And yet the purpose of these warnings is to be a means by which God uses to keep his elect from falling away. You know, we'll say things like God ordains the end 
But God also ordains the means to the end. And one of the means by which he keeps you to the end is the warnings. It's like those guardrails going up a windy mountain pass. It's like touching a hot skillet on a stove and it wakes you up. So that we heed the warning and we remain steadfastly loyal to Jesus. And to believe that if, listen, if I don't persevere in faith to the end, if I fall away, I won't be saved. Okay, let's look at the text. I think the best way to approach this is to ask three questions here of this first heading. Three questions. Let me give them to you. Question number one. Who are those being spoken of here? Who's being addressed? Question number two, what what kind of warning is this? What's What's the nature of this warning? And then third, what's the consequence if I don't heed it? What will happen if I don't heed this warning? I think those questions will help us navigate our way through verses four through eight. First, question number one, who are those being spoken of right here? And my answer to that question is that he is speaking here to genuine believers. Genuine Christians. Now, first of all, I think it's important that when you read these five warning passages in Hebrews, you read them all together so that they mutually interpret one another. So you can't isolate Hebrews chapter 6 and interpret it differently, I think, than all the other warnings in this letter. No, you have to, I think, read them all together. They help to explain one another. And when you do that, what do you discover? Well, let's go back. Chapter 2. Look at chapter 2 for a moment in verse 1. He says, we must we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard lest we drift away. Notice the author uses the first person plural pronoun we. We, meaning he believes this warning is for him as well. It's not just for the unconverted in the church. It's not just for the almost Christians in the church. It's for him. It's for us. It's for we. Or look at the next one. Look at chapter 3, verse 12, where he says, take care, brothers. Brothers in the faith. Brothers. In fact, in chapter 3, verse 1, he calls them holy brothers. But then he admonishes them in verse 12, take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. He believes they are brothers. They are real Christians. Or look ahead, chapter 10. We'll see this warning in due time. Chapter 10 and verse 29. Chapter 10, verse 29, he'll say, how much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant. I think that's parallel to chapter 6, verse 6. Re-crucifying the Son of God, holding him up to contempt. How much worse, he says, for this person, the punishment, by which he was sanctified. Past tense. He has been sanctified. So the author gives this warning to those he thinks are already sanctified. So when you take all those warnings together, allowing them to mutually interpret one another, it becomes clear, at least to me it does, he's talking to real genuine believers. But then it also seems apparent to me that he's speaking to real Christians when you look at the way he describes them here now in our text. Go back now to Hebrews 6 for a moment. Verses 4 and 5, look there. Verses 4 and 5, notice who the warning is addressed to. 
verse 4. It is impossible, and we'll come back to that impossible thing here. It is impossible in the case of those who have, and then he goes on to describe them in five ways. There are five participles, five clauses here, and each of them, I believe, describing those who are truly saved. So let's walk through each of them very briefly and try to see what he's doing here. Look at the first one. Number one, he says, those who have once been enlightened. Verse four, for it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened. This, I believe, characterizes someone who's come to a saving knowledge of Christ. This this describes the decisive moment at conversion. Once, they've once been enlightened. You see, all of us, prior to our conversion, we were blind. We were blinded to the truth. We didn't have eyes to see. We weren't enlightened. And in an act of grace, the Spirit of God sovereignly and He savingly opened our hearts and He opened our spiritual eyes and He opened our minds to see and understand the gospel. And we were enlightened. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, notice what Paul says here in verse 4. He says, The God of this world, that's Satan, has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. They can't see it. Verse 6, But God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God and the face of Jesus Christ. Notice that it's God the one who does this. God is the one who enlightens us. We're, We're passive in this. And then the lights come on. We've been enlightened. Look at this, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 23, or 32. Hebrews 10, 32. This is helpful because it's the only other place in Hebrews where this word enlightened is used. Same word. Clearly, in Hebrews 10, 32, has in mind their conversion. Verse 32. But recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings. Meaning, he's talking about their post-conversion days. After they had turned savingly in faith and repentance, they had once been enlightened. Second, not only had they once been enlightened, second, who have tasted, go back to chapter 6, verse 4, who have tasted the heavenly gift. Now, what's the heavenly gift? Well, elsewhere in the New Testament, this gift is used to speak of the gift of the Holy Spirit. John chapter 4, Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 10, the gift of the Holy Spirit, or the gift of righteousness in Romans chapter 5. But it's quite possible he also simply means the gift, this gift being the life and salvation they have in Christ. This is the heavenly gift. Now, the, that other view, the traditional reform view that I was telling you about, will state that the word taste here means that these were non-Christians who had had spiritual experiences. Like they had been in the church, they had been around spiritual things, they had experienced spiritual things being within the church, and it was a, it's sort of like a partial taste of this gift. But taste cannot mean that. It cannot mean that because earlier, go back to chapter 2, verse 9, Jesus tasted death for everyone. Which cannot mean that he only partially tasted death. He took a little sip of death. He It was a partial experience of death. No. 
He fully drank the cup of death. He fully drank the cup of God's wrath. And so he has tasted death for us all, fully. So when the author says they've tasted the heavenly gift, I think it most naturally means they have experienced the heavenly gift of salvation that comes from above. But I think the nail in the coffin for me, the most conclusive that he is speaking to genuine believers here comes in that next description. Look there again in verse four, chapter six. They have shared in the Holy Spirit. That's the way the ESV translates it, shared in. New American Standard translates it, they have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit. HCSB, the Holman Christian, says they become companions with the Holy Spirit. But however you translate it, it seems to suggest that they have become friends with the Holy Spirit. They have been partakers of the Holy Spirit. They have shared in the Holy Spirit. Now, Again, that traditional view will say that this is an experience of the Spirit. They they have participated in the life of the church. They've seen the Spirit's work. They've shared in that, but it's an experience that falls short of the saving, regenerating work of the Spirit. However, when you take this word here, shared in, and see how it's used elsewhere in Hebrews, it means fully participated in. So for example, go back to chapter 3, verse 1. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in the heavenly calling, they share in it. They fully have it. Or chapter 3, verse 14. True believers have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. Or lest we forget chapter 2, verse 14. Did Jesus share fully in flesh and blood? No, the sign that someone is a Christian is that they have received the Holy Spirit. And so sharing in the Holy Spirit is the clearest indication in the New Testament that you are a Christian. Meaning he's saying, I think, they are Christians. They are Christians in the fullest sense of the word. Finally, those last two. Look there, four and five. Taking them together because they use that same participle governing them, taste. Look there, chapter or verse 5. They've tasted the goodness of the word of God, and they've tasted of the powers of the age to come. Tasted. It's the same as tasted the heavenly gift in verse 4. What's he saying? They have taken in the word of God. They have received the gospel of Jesus Christ and they have truly experienced the powers, they've tasted of the powers of the age to come, meaning they've now experienced the end time blessings that have broken into this age at the coming of Christ. So this is, a, this is a real experience. This is not some partial experience. This is not some ineffectual experience. These are real believers. He's warning So then how are we to understand the warning? If this warning is warning real Christians whom I've said already that can't fall away, then the warning means nothing, right? Question number two, what is the nature of this warning? What's the nat- what kind of warning is this? And I think the easiest way I can say it is this. This warning is a real warning. It's a real warning. To genuine believers. That if you do not hold fast. If you do not persevere in faith to the end. You will not be saved. 
your perseverance in faith to the end, Christian, is necessary for your final salvation. Not justifying you, that kind of salvation. I'm talking about your final salvation in the end. Remember, the aim of the, aim of the author here is, is, is a pastoral one. What's the purpose of these warnings? He doesn't want them to turn away. Oh, he doesn't want them to abandon the gospel. He doesn't want them to drift away. Do you see that tendency in your own heart? He doesn't want them to have an evil, unbelieving heart leading them to fall away. So what does he do? He warns them. So then this warning is, this warning is conditional. It isn't as if he's making some kind of judgment or declaration about them that they've already fallen away. That's not what he's doing. But he is looking into the future. And he's warning them of where this dullness of hearing could lead them. It could lead you to apostasy. And so in love and in grace, he's admonishing them, and he's exhorting, and he's saying, don't, don't fall away. That's, that's what warnings do. You know, there, 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 I remember several years ago, there was circulating that if your kids ate one of those dishwasher pods, remember this, Tide Pods, a lot of parents freaking out, they, they, could, they would die, they could die. They could poison them. So what did we do as parents? If you eat this, you could die. In fact, they even begin putting the warning box on the label. So, what is the warning? It's a means of preventing the consequence from being realized. It's a means of preventing that consequence, don't drink the poison, from being realized. Which leads to the third question. What is the consequence of failing to heed this warning? Again, look at verse 4. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away to be restored again to repentance. Repentance. They were restored once, but they can't be restored again. Verse 4, it is impossible. Now that word there is, is placed at the beginning of the sentence in the Greek because it's emphatic. He, he doesn't say it's difficult. He doesn't say it's unlikely. He doesn't say it's improbable. What does he say? It is impossible. Chapter 6, verse 18, it is impossible for God to lie. Chapter 10, verse 14, it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Chapter 11, verse 6, without faith it is impossible to please God. There's a lot of impossibles in Hebrews. You know what the word impossible means? Impossible. <laughs> Friend, if you turn away from Christ and you leave the gospel in sort of a final, decisive kind of way, there is no hope for you. You cannot be restored again to repentance. Because the only way for you to be saved is to turn away from your sin and turn to faith in Jesus Christ alone. No, he's saying you have abandoned the only hope there is for the forgiveness of your sins. You've fallen away from that. And if you walk away from that, it's impossible to be saved. 
In fact, just notice the very provocative language he uses there in verse 6. You are crucifying once again the Son of God to your own harm and holding him up to contempt. In other words, to abandon Christ and then to think you will ever return, to be restored again to repentance, would be like re-crucifying him all over again. And in essence, to say that his death was for nothing, you're holding him up to contempt. And then in verses 7 and 8, notice he gives this illustration, this metaphor of the consequences of apostasy by giving us the metaphor here of two different kinds of land. Look there. First is the land that receives the rain that has fallen on it. And as a result, notice what happens. It produces fruit. Look at verse 7. Produces a fruit, a crop that is useful, which is a blessing of God. But verse 8, notice, the other land receives the same rain, but instead this land bears thorns and thistles and is unfruitful. It is worthless, he says. So the point is clear. The land here represents them. The land here, listen, represents us today who have received the refreshing rains of God's blessing. We have, we have received the word. You've heard the warning. You've heard it. So in response to God's goodness, we should produce good fruit and we should persevere and we should not fall away. Otherwise, the end result is the judgment of God. Look at verse 8. It is worthless and near, and I think the near means in view of the final judgment that's coming, near of being cursed and its end is to be burned. That is a terrifying statement. And it's a stark reminder to us that continued faith, persevering faith, is necessary if you hope to reach eternal life. And these warnings are a means of grace by which God keeps you. By which he keeps you. Why? Because true believers will never fall away. And they will be fruitful. And they will always heed the warning. Let me end here by saying this. We're not going to get to point two. If you are here this morning and you are thinking about, you are contemplating leaving Jesus, heed this warning. Heed this warning. If, if you are no longer impressed with Jesus anymore, if, if, if you're questioning whether or not it's worth it to follow Jesus, please, I'm begging you, hear this warning. It is impossible in the case of those who have fallen away to restore them again to repentance. Do not think for one second, I, I'm not so sure anymore about this Jesus stuff, or I think, you know, I'm going to try my hand at the world, or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live this way for a while, and then I'll come back later. Then, you know, he's going to forgive me, right? Listen to me. Do not be so confident. Do not play games with God. Do not demean the cross. Father, what a sobering warning. Thank you that in such a very pastoral way here, the author of Hebrews, first of all, he warns them. And then he turns right around and he encourages them. 
And he says, I have, I'm sure of better things for you. Thank you for that reality that sometimes we need warnings and sometimes we need encouragements. And we pray your grace would help us to see both. By your spirit to do this work in us. And so if there are some here today who need to heed the warning, all of us today, let us heed it. If there's some who today who just need to rest in the keeping power of God's preserving grace, oh, let us do that too. Looking to Jesus, the one who keeps us by his death that has accomplished our salvation, who keeps us to the end. Praise God for his grace. Amen. We trust you were encouraged by the message you heard. For more information about our church, visit us online at www.2bcmtv.org or call us at 618-244-1706. And thank you for listening.